This video was brought to you by Brilliant. British Airways, Air France, Lufthansa, Iberia, LOT, TAP. Essentially every country in the world has a flag carrier airline. In fact, most of these airlines were once, or even continue to be, state-owned. But regardless of ownership, all of these airlines have a clear link to their home countries. But despite this patriotic reputation, none of these flag carriers, nor any other European airline, flies more people than Ryanair. Now, Ryanair is no country's flag carrier, not even its home country of Ireland. Yet still, it's come to represent European air travel more than most of these others. It's dominated and democratized travel across the continent, and in many ways, it's become the entire continent's flag carrier. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention will be important. In approximately... Founded in 1984 and first taking flight in 1985, Ryanair wasn't the world's first low-cost airline. In fact, Ryanair wasn't even a low-budget airline when they first launched. Their original route took passengers from Waterford in Ireland to London Gatwick Airport and was a full-service offering, taking Irish business people over to London for work on a single propeller aircraft and then returning 12 hours later to save them from staying overnight in London. Now, this route was a little odd and the audience may be a touch niche, but they were moderately successful straight out of the gate, flying 5,000 passengers in their first year despite using only one aircraft that was so small that staff couldn't be taller than 160 centimeters due to the height of the cabin. In their second year of operation though, Ryanair upped their game, taking on two 48-seater planes and shifting over from Waterford to the more popular Dublin. Now that obviously made life easier for Ryanair in many ways, but it did lead them to directly compete with major carriers like British Airways and Aer Lingus, true flag carriers. However, with a lower price tag than their competitors, Ryanair was still able to stand out on this route. But at what cost? Five years later, as they entered the 1990s, Ryanair saw their passenger numbers rocket from 5,000 in year one to 644,000. And their staff went from just 25 height-restricted team members to 477. But despite this relative success, the business's long-term prospects were looking worrying. Running a full-service airline like this, one running directly up against big incumbents while still attempting to undercut their price, is difficult and obviously expensive. So entering into the new decade, Ryanair had a big new plan. Inspired by low-cost carriers like Pacific Southwest, who began the trend in the 1940s, and Icelandic Air, who offered the first transatlantic budget flights in the 1960s, they decided to bring that low-cost business model to Europe, with them describing themselves as Europe's first low-fares airline. Now, not only were they the first to the market, but as Europe's biggest airline today, they clearly got something right in the 90s. So let's learn what they implemented in the 1990s by taking a flight with them today. So today we're headed out to Cologne in Germany on a flight run by Ryanair in order to make a video about Audi for the TLDR business channel. And just by taking a look at Google flights for this route, you can very quickly see one of their big innovations following their 1990 relaunch, regular flights. In 2023, Ryanair flies over 2,500 flights every single day to 226 different destinations across the continent. But this focus on regular journeys isn't a new thing. Ever since their 1990 relaunch, Ryanair has been focused on getting people where they want, when they want it. More like a bus than a traditional airline. The next thing they did in the 90s was begin shifting to a single aircraft type. Now, previously, they'd been using a whole variety of craft with a variety of configurations and restrictions, although none of them required extra small staff members by this point. 
Throughout the 90s, though, Ryanair standardized their fleet, first taking delivery of their now ubiquitous Boeing 737s in 1994, before replacing their entire fleet of 11 planes with 737s by the end of 1995. Now, this trend continued throughout the decade, with them buying exclusively 737s, and then investing even harder in the aircraft in the months following the 9-11 attacks, allowing them to secure discounts on bulk-ordered craft when other airlines were pulling their investment. In fact, by 2006, they had 100 737s in their fleet. By 2009, that had reached 200, and today it's more than 400, making them the world's largest operator of 737-800s, something which has reportedly allowed them to secure massive discounts from Boeing. It's not just the discounts, either. This standardization of planes allows the airline to save a lot of money throughout the plane's entire lifespan. That's because this unified approach simplifies work at all levels, from seat reservation systems to staff training to pilots to maintenance. And as a result, this approach means that any Ryanair employee can transfer across routes and craft with ease, limiting training costs, allowing for easy substitutes and far lower maintenance fees. It's not just the standardized 737s either. The planes that Ryanair orders have been increasingly optimized to make maintenance and cleaning costs as low as possible. When boarding a Ryanair flight, you'll be struck by the white clean yellow plastic that you see everywhere on board, as well as the safety cards which are printed on the back of your seat. This allows Ryanair not to have a seat back pocket at all, which means there's less places to clean between flights and avoids having to replace damaged safety cards. And it's not only that, these seats don't recline either, saving space and preventing maintenance issues going forward. There's also no opportunity to upgrade your seat. There's no business class section on any Ryanair flight, which further streamlines their business model. Combined, these aircraft efficiencies allow Ryanair pretty impressive turnaround times, with their planes regularly spending only about 30 minutes on the ground between flights, saving staff time and allowing planes to be used as much as possible. The third major change that came after the 1990 relaunch was the removal of their complimentary food and drink offering, something which is more common on premium airlines. Now, this obviously cut food and drink costs, but it also freed up their staff members and allowed them to actually upcharge for refreshments if passengers weren't able to fill up before the flight. In fact, that's not the only upcharge that Ryanair's famous for. Book a flight on Ryanair's website and you'll find yourself swamped with options and sales pitches. Want to bring on a bag bigger than a backpack? You're going to have to pay for that. Want to choose your own seat? Well, that costs extra too. Forget to print your boarding pass before arriving at the airport? You'll be charged for that. Need to change the name on your ticket, say to match the official one on your passport? Well, that'll cost you up to £160. Use a certain type of card to pay? Yep, additional fees. Want any food and drink on board? Well, you better hope you've got an overdraft ready. Plus, when booking, you'll also be offered a bunch of other offers and upgrades from Ryanair's partners. Now, these things aren't totally unique, but Ryanair takes bare-bones service very seriously, and pretty much anything beyond the total basics is an upcharge. In fact, the company's CEO infamously joked about charging to use the bathroom on their flights. Uh, and if, charging, if, we, if we can find a mechanism of charging for toilet access, it would make perfect sense to me to charge for toilet access. One, it would reduce the number of people who are bothering other passengers getting up and down going to the toilet on board a flight. And two, I think we'd have fewer passengers using the toilets. More people would simply go before they leave or immediately after they arrive to save a pound, and we'd have less people queuing around the toilets on board the aircraft. Now, another notable change as a result of the 1990 rebrand was a shift towards smaller, cheaper airports. Now, while flag carriers often fly from more expensive central airports, Ryanair has been able to cut their costs by taking cheaper slots at less desirable airports, with them moving their London base to the pretty contentious Stansted just two years after their relaunch in 1992. 
Um, maybe not coincidentally, this was also the first year they made an audited profit of £293,000. Not only that, when at airports, they essentially never use jet bridges. This allows them to use the cheapest gates at the cheapest airports, saving money by making passengers either walk along the tarmac to the terminal or get on a bus to the terminal. Either way, never using a jet bridge is a serious saving for Ryanair. Finally, one other major area that airlines are able to save money is around fueling. Unsurprisingly, fueling a plane isn't cheap, so Ryanair regularly hedge their fuel purchasing, bulk buying fuel when it's cheap, and then carrying as little fuel on each plane as possible, both practically and legally, allowing them to push fueling costs as low as they possibly can. So, those are some of the key optimizations that Ryanair began making in 1990 and have continued rolling out ever since in order to slowly become Europe's biggest airline. That's interesting. But since 1990, Ryanair's growth has been helped by a number of other factors, though, on top of these serious optimizations. For instance, in 1992, the EU deregulated the airline industry significantly, which allowed Ryanair and other airlines to increase their scheduled services and contributed to them taking over from Aer Lingus and BA as the biggest carrier between London and Dublin by 1996. Then, in 1997, the EU approved the Open Skies Agreement with the US, which further simplified EU law surrounding air travel, with Ryanair taking advantage of this and launching their first flight into mainland Europe in the same year, travelling to Oslo and Stockholm. In 2000, Ryanair then took advantage of the digital age, launching their new website in order to cut out travel agents and lower costs yet further. A shift towards digital which they continued into 2009 when they scrapped check-in desks at their airports, requiring customers to do everything online besides bag drop. And today, this strategy of cheap and efficient flights still works. In fact, in the late 2010s, they launched Ryanair Sun, now rebranded Buzz. They also purchased Louder Motion, which they rebranded to just Louder. And in 2019, they even worked with the government of Malta to launch a brand new airline, Malta Air. Not to be confused with Air Malta, the country's existing flag carrier. By the way, if you want to learn more about how Ryanair became five separate companies and launched all of these brands, then we have a separate video coming out on that topic over on the TLDR Business channel very soon. That's a channel where we discuss all kinds of topics like this, including how Audi is secretly two separate companies, the battle between Google and the new ChatGPT-powered Bing, or even the secret economics of porn. TLDR Business is linked below, and you should subscribe and ring the bell now to be notified when that video releases. Anyway, with this expanding fleet and new route map, Ryanair has been able to dominate travel across the continent as one of the biggest airlines at almost all of Europe's major air hubs. In fact, they've expanded so far by this point that the UK and Ireland aren't even their biggest market anymore. That's because they've flown more people in and out of Italy every year since 2014 than they have the UK, with their flight numbers even totally outpacing Italy's flag carrier. So how did Ryanair become Europe's de facto flag carrier? Well, since their shift to low cost in the 1990s, they took advantage of shifting EU regulations and ruthlessly optimised to reduce costs not only opening up air travel to consumers previously priced out of the market, but also allowing the business to grow to a scale never before imaginable. Which means that no matter where you are in Europe, it's likely only a couple of hours or even minutes until your next Ryanair flight. But while we're waiting, it only takes a few minutes every day to massively improve your skills and safeguard your career against artificial intelligence. That's by investing in your own human intelligence. And that's where Brilliant.org comes in. Brilliant.org is the best way to learn maths and computer science in a fun and interactive way. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from foundational and advanced maths to AI, data science, neural networks, decision making, and more, 
with new lessons added monthly. That logical decision-making course is super interesting too, using principles from maths and science to help you reach your own decisions. And I'm not naming any names, but perhaps some politicians ought to get a brilliant account. Anyway, you can try everything that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days by clicking our link in the description. Plus, the first 200 TLDR viewers to do that will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks for your support, and thanks for watching TLDR.